You're listening to EcoShock Radio for the world. I'm Alex Smith. Get it all at our website, ecoshock.org. This is Radio EcoShock with your host, Alex Smith. Let's get on to our next guest, Dr. Edward Hanna, who explains more about the shocking melt on Greenland this year. When billions of metric tons of Greenland ice melted into the sea in 2012, a team of scientists said it was more than global warming, a pattern of atmospheric pressure zones called the North Atlantic Oscillation, or NAO, was boosting the big melt. Now that supermelt on Greenland has happened again this summer of 2019. Hundreds of billions of metric tons of ice just poured off Greenland into the sea. Sea levels will rise measurably from what happened there just in July. Edward Hanna, Javier Fetvis, and team published the paper Important Role of Mid-Tropospheric Atmospheric Circulation in the Recent Surface Melt Increase over the Greenland Ice Sheet, and that was about 2012. Dr. Edward Hanna is a professor of climate science and meteorology at the University of Lincoln, UK. We last spoke on Radio Ecoshock in January 2018 about a cold pattern in North American or European winters due to changes in the Arctic. Edward Hanna, welcome back to Radio Ecoshock. Thank you very much, Alex. The size and the speed of that Greenland melt this summer just shocked me. I thought, this is a major climate event, and it's one the public cannot see. Did it surprise you? Well, not at all, really, because, I mean, after the uh, mammoth surface melt of, of 2012, which was arguably even even greater from, from some measures, it, it seemed quite clear to me and other scientists, I think, as well, who are working on, um, on Greenland, that um, you don't need that much of an extra warming to actually recreate that event. So the ice sheet's already quite warm around the edges in summer. So just get it, making it one or two degrees warmer and shifting warm air masses slightly further north over Greenland is going to have a big response with the melt. So coexisting with the hottest July ever recorded by humans, we have this other strange invisible force. What is the North Atlantic Oscillation, please? So the North Atlantic Oscillation, it's basically measuring the airflow across the North Atlantic Ocean. Now, because the Earth is rotating, um, there's a prevailing jet stream that generally flows from west to east, which is also driven by a difference in in heat, where generally it's it's hotter further south than than further north. So there's always an, an attempt by the atmosphere to redistribute heat from lower from further south towards further north. So the jet stream is always doing that to some level, and the North Atlantic Oscillation is a way of measuring the jet stream activity in the North Atlantic region. Now, imagine if you had two household barometers that measure air pressure, and one of them's in the Azores Islands in the middle of the Atlantic, in the subtropics, so uh, somewhere in the 30s latitude, and the other barometer is located on Iceland, much further north in the North Atlantic. So if you take a, a simple pressure gradient, so the difference that the air pressure between those two barometers across the North Atlantic, then in effect that's giving you a a measure of the strength of the winds across the North Atlantic because the air pressure difference is related to how strong the the winds are. And that's basically what the North Atlantic Oscillation is. It's a difference in air pressure at the surface from a barometer further south in the North Atlantic, difference from a barometer further north in the North Atlantic. How do we know there are two phases and what phase we are in? So now what can happen is the jet stream, although it normally flows from west to east across the North Atlantic, it can sometimes reverse direction and and actually flow in the opposite way or or sometimes neutralize. There's no net airflow going from west to east or the opposite across the North Atlantic. So the two phases of the North Atlantic Oscillation are simply measuring the direction of airflow and and the strength of the winds and air pressure gradients across the North Atlantic. So under normal conditions, you have a positive NAO phase. So that's with westerly winds blowing from west to east across the North Atlantic. When a jet stream weakens, and sometimes reverses direction, you can get a negative NEO phase, which is with easterly winds across the North Atlantic. So it's a matter of definition, but also there's a real physical change linked in with that. Well, what you've said just explains something I've been wondering about, because various news organizations and a couple of scientists said that the great heat wave that went over France and northern Europe 
this past summer, I think it was in July, slid over to Greenland. And I thought, well, how can the air be moving west against the jet stream? But sometimes it, it does reverse like that, and it could slide from Europe up over into Greenland. Yes, and in fact, this was a rather unusual direction of air mass that affected the summer conditions over Greenland, because normally when you get a heat wave over Greenland in summer, it's air masses that are coming from the southwest or, or from the south, more from a, with a westerly direction up over the um, western flank of the ice sheet. But in this case, the weather charts show quite definitely that the, as you say, that the, um, that the air pressure situation developed southeast of Greenland and actually moved west from the east side of Greenland up over the ice sheet. Now, trying to learn what the NAO is, the public is given the analogy of the El Nino-La Nina cycles in the Pacific Ocean, which we've come to learn because it affects our own weather, especially here in North America. Is that good enough or can we do better? I think we can probably do better. I think from one point of view, it's, it's useful to make that comparison, but they are two quite different weather systems. So whereas the El Nino is uh, very tightly coupled between the ocean and the atmosphere conditions over the tropical Pacific Ocean, albeit if it affects um, weather conditions further afield sometimes, the North Atlantic Oscillation can actually operate without any significant effects from the ocean. And uh, computer models of, um, that have actually been simulating this have, have demonstrated this in in some previous studies. However, that's not to say that there's not an effect of the ocean on the NAO or, or that the um, NAO can't affect the ocean. It's just that it's a less strong effect probably than with the El Nino. So the other point to note is that the North Atlantic Oscillation, it's involving uh, middle latitude climates, which are inherently quite different from tropical climates, which is where the El Nino originates. Has the NAO continued in its current phase since that big Greenland melt of 2012? I mean, how long does one cycle last? Well, there's, there's actually no preferred time scale of activity. There are weak um, peaks of activity, if you like, at something like 6 or 10 or 17 years, something on those time scales. And in fact, I'm just looking now at a graph of the um, NAO that I drew up for the last um, just over a century or so. And it does look that every few um, decades you get uh, peaks and troughs. But again, um, it's a little bit chaotic and there's a lot of noise amongst the signal there. But what we saw in 2012 was an unusually um, deep negative phase of the NEO, so unusually low NEO or negative NEO, that was repeated to some level this summer. So the NEO has been quite negative for most of this summer. Um, and when that happens, you get higher pressure developing over, over Greenland, as we saw very strong in, uh, in 2012, but also this year. However, some of the um, intervening years between 2012 and this year, 2019, have actually had quite uh, positive NEOs or relatively weak high-pressure blockings over Greenland. So there is a lot of year-to-year -year variability in the NEO and high pressure over Greenland, as well as the um, longer decadal timescale variability. So, so it's a complex picture, but basically there, there have been some quite large year-to-year -year fluctuations in the NAO between um, 2012 and the, and the present year. So is there any way to assess how much of the recent huge ice loss on Greenland is due to the NAO state and how much to global warming or other things like the albedo change? Yeah, so there have been a number of studies that have attempted to isolate the um, various what we call um, driving or forcing effects of melting or, or mass change on, on the ice sheet. So these include things like um, the general global warming trend as well as year-to-year -year variability of the North Atlantic Oscillation or of high pressure blocking over, over Greenland. So there is a significant effect from, from natural variability. It might be very roughly half of the signal in any given year from natural variability, but there's also a very strong effect from the global warming signal as well in driving the um, recent general warming in Greenland and, and quite dramatic increase in um, loss of mass of, of the ice sheet that we've seen in the last 15 to 20 years or so. So what happens when we go to the other pattern of pressure? So um, this year it's been a um, quite a strong negative NEO, as, as was the situation in 2012, which, as I say, means high pressure blocking over Greenland, which tends to drag up warmer southerly airflow and melt the ice sheet. So the opposite NEO conditions would be a positive NEO phase, which would tend to be linked with weaker blocking over Greenland and less melt, all other things being equal. The point 
here, of course, is that things are not equal because of global warming. So superimposed on all this natural variability, we also have a uh, general warming trend, which means that various accelerated melt kicks in over the ice sheet. So darkening of the ice sheet surface, for example, due to various feedbacks as you get more melt, it accelerates the melting with a darker water at the surface and more impurities at the surface. So there's, there's other feedbacks as, as well, such as the effects of a warmer ocean around Greeners, which mean that even with these natural um, weather changes, if you like, from year to year, even if the natural so- cycle swings back the other way, because we've got a strong warming effect on Greenland from global warming, it's not enough to, to counter the um, increase in the melt that we've seen. It might slow it down a bit for a few years, but not, not really stop it. I'm interested in how climate change can sometimes alter these big systems, and uh, I wonder, could the NAO pressure system over the Atlantic get stuck in one position or dwindle to no effect due to climate change? What are your thoughts? Well, I think due to climate change, we're seeing higher pressure over Greenland in, in summer, which is obviously that's the season when it's, when it's warmest, when you get the uh, main melting of the ice sheet and the mass being lost from the ice sheet each year. There's good physical reasons to expect that that high pressure will prevail in summer and become even stronger moving ahead. So one factor is that warmer air masses over the ice sheet expands. That gives you higher pressure on average. So this tends to block and, and divert the jet stream, push it further south more in summer over the North Atlantic and give you a more negative or a reduced NEO signal. But there's many effects on NEO and other effects from um, changes in sea temperature patterns in the North Atlantic, for example. But there's actually um, many effects on the jet stream and, and the NEO. So I, I don't think there's any reliable simulations at the regional level of how the climate will change over the North Atlantic. So it's not like the global climate model predictions where we know fairly reliably that there's going to be a strong and significant warming, albeit we we can't precisely define the amount. But looking at the jet stream over the North Atlantic is such a complex picture that we, we, we can't really definitely say how it's going to play out during the rest of this century. But there are lots of effects and, and so we're likely to see further changes. Dr. James Hansen and a long list of co-authors published a mammoth paper, and in that discussion, the scientists suggest the North Atlantic could cool from Greenland meltwaters even as the rest of the world is warming. Do you see that happening, and what might that mean for weather in the Northern Hemisphere? So the oceanography aspect of increased melt from Greenland is really quite interesting because um, we we do see increased melt water running off of parts of the um, southern margins of the ice sheet in particular, and particularly on on the eastern side or southeastern side of the ice sheet. That can potentially be concentrated, focused in quite a small region and affect the stability of of ocean waters in that part of the North Atlantic. In particular, potentially it could affect the uh, so-called deep water part of the global ocean circulation. I think the studies I've seen so far, there's there's a lot of conflicting opinions and, and we simply don't know enough because we don't have, have enough span of observations. But, but there is a... Um cooling or, or certainly not a temperature increase in, in uh, part of the North Atlantic just southeast of Greenland in the last um, 10 or 20 years or so. And, and I certainly think that an increase in ice melt could be contributing to that regional cooling. However, at the global level, that's a relatively unimportant change, although if it, if it bears out during the rest of this century, it could have some uh, severe consequences on the uh, making the winter climates of parts of northwest Europe, the UK, for example, more severe. We, we don't really have enough evidence here yet, I would say. Right, and several popular press articles bring up the change of reflectivity of the sun's rays or albedo in the Greenland ice problem, and certainly falling smoke from record fires in the Arctic are darkening the glaciers, but is there also a change in albedo simply because the surface layer has melted away? Well, there's, there's certainly um, increased melting, and meltwater itself is darker, and, and the increased melting exposes more impurities near the surface of the ice, so not just smoke from forest fires, but other uh, impurities and rocky debris and, and even biogenic debris within the ice algae and so on. So overall, most of the data from satellites uh, for the last uh, couple of decades seem to suggest a, um, a decline in the albedo of, of, of the ice. So it's getting dark. The, the ice surface, and this tends to accelerate the, the melting and warming of much of the ice sheets. But it's, it's not simply because of melting of the surface ice, but it's all these other factors and, and feedback effects, some of which I've mentioned. 
You are tuned to Radio EcoShock. We are talking about the huge loss of ice on Greenland with Dr. Edward Hanna, Professor of Climate Science and Meteorology at the University of Lincoln in the UK. Edward, does most of the meltwater go into the ocean or does some of it evaporate, raising humidity in the atmosphere? Well, there will be a secondary effect for increased evaporation of near-surface water, but we've got to remember the Arctic atmosphere is, is pretty cold compared with further south. It can hold a limited amount of water vapor. I think the main effect by far is for increased meltwater to go into the ocean. And how much has sea level gone up because of Greenland melt? Well, in the last, I would say, um, 17, 18 years, there have been a series of satellites called GRACE, which have been quite accurately measuring long-term changes in the mass balance of the ice sheet. So it's something like 250 billion tonnes per year averaged over that period. So that's equivalent this century so far to something like 10 to 15 millimetres of sea level rise because of melting from the ice sheet. Of course, that's only part of the global sea level rise. There's lots of other factors that are increasing global sea level as well. And do you have an informed guess about how much ice Greenland might lose by the end of the century and, and what sea level rise might come from that? It's quite poorly known still at the moment. So I think a conservative, so lower end estimate, would be probably somewhere between 10 and 15 centimetres of extra sea level rise from just from Greenland by the rest of this century. However, in my opinion, and I, I, I think that there's, there's a number of other scientists who, who agree it could be um, considerably larger than that, so easily double that. And remember that actually, at the moment, Greenland is the main contributor from the icy realm to sea level rise, but there's also probably nearly equal from Antarctica Arctic ice sheets, and actually a greater contribution from warmer seawater expanding as it gets warmer, so thermal expansion of warmer seawater. So that's only uh, a relatively small part of the overall sea level story. So overall, it could could easily be somewhere around a metre, potentially even a bit more by the end of this century. Sorry, that's in terms of the the overall sea level rise, not purely from Greenland. Yes, understood. So when we talk about Antarctica, a lot of the scientific looks are at warmer seawaters going under the glaciers and uh, licking away at the base of them. Do you think that's happening in Greenland as well, warmer oceans moving into the Arctic? Yes. So um, there there are a number of what we call outlets or sea-terminating glaciers from Greenland. It's not as many as for Antarctica, but they are major outlets of the Greenland ice sheet, nevertheless. So, for example, Jakobshaven in the west of the ice sheet and Hakkanglusak and Helheim in the east, and there are others as well. So there's certainly very likely to already have been an effect of, of warmer ocean water is in destabilizing those glacier termini in the last couple of decades or so. But what we're seeing from the warmer oceans propagating into the Arctic or warming of Arctic seawater is melting of, of the sea ice e- even more immediately. And, of course, that in turn can also feed back on melting extra ice over, over the Greenland region that is land-based. How can loss of sea ice affect the melting of Greenland? Well, because you're exposing... Greenland, which is used to be surrounded by sea ice for a longer part of of the year, at least in northern regions, to potentially warmer air masses if if the ocean is closer to the the margins of of the land or the ice sheets. Right. There was a big open patch north of Greenland last year that was unusual, and it's happened again this year. Yes, so I've not looked directly at that, but just flying over back from a a meeting in Alaska a few weeks ago, even much further north in the Beaufort Sea near to the North Pole, it was quite striking how much how much open um, water areas within the ice. But of course, from satellite data, we have a a fairly complete picture of sea ice changes going back for um, a few decades now, and we've we've lost something like three quarters of the um, volume of the sea ice cover in the Arctic Ocean in um, late summer in the month of September since the late nineties. I worry, Edward, that some global warming denier, and there are a few left, they'll try and use a bit of your research against climate claims. They might say, well, you see, Greenland melting is just a natural cycle. It's the NAO. It will switch back to cold. It's not climate change. What do you say to that? Well, Climate is always changing. So from one point of view, they're right, but superimposed on the natural variability, such as uh, by the NAO, although I would argue that part of the NAO is not necessarily naturally driven, is this very strong warming trend through um, greenhouse gas increases from human activity. And that is really the dominant climate trend. If we look at the last 
50 years at the global scale. And it's, it's certainly having an effect on Greenland temperatures in the last 20 years or so. So I, I've been involved in, in some work where we've um, looked at how the climate regionally in Greenland corresponds to wider global temperatures as well as to these natural cycles such as the NEO and we see a much more direct association of the Greenland temperatures with the global temperatures in the um, later parts of the record. So I, I would certainly suggest that there's very strong evidence from the Arctic and Greenland from climate science that bears out the idea of a accelerated effect of, of human driven climate change on the Arctic region including Greenland. You co-authored a paper saying that climate models completely failed to predict the sudden speed of ice loss on Greenland. So we don't really know what could happen there? So I think the paper you're referring to, possibly, correct me if I'm wrong, please, was the, um, had a paper out last year with Xavier Fetwai and Richard Hall in the cryosphere, which I think you interviewed me incidentally last November on. And that was um, highlighting um, some of the um, latest generation of global climate models, um, their failure to, um, to predict accurately regional changes in air circulation over the Greenland region, so changes in higher pressure that we've been talking about earlier in, in this current interview. So there is a mismatch between some of the um, best available recent climate models and what the observations have shown for the last decade. So watch this space because we need to improve the climate models at the regional level. And way back in 2006 when I began this program, Edward Scientist calmed us saying Greenland would take thousands of years to melt. It would be gradual and it would be orderly. What is the thinking now among specialists who research as you do? So it's certainly true that because it's such a vast mass of ice um, that it would take at least a couple of thousand years to melt in its entirety. However, the uh, quite big effects could be seen much earlier on within that overall melt cycle, of course. So that's already starting in the sense that Greenland is, is very far from being in balance. We've already got something like a 250 to 300 billion tonnes per year of net ice mass loss into the oceans. So that's directly affecting global sea level rise. And of course, as it, as it warms further, then that is likely to, to accelerate it in a way that is not, it, it's actually non-linear. So the more warming, the more it accelerates the ice melt. So as I said before in this interview, Getting somewhere in the order of 15, 20, up to 30 centimetres of sea level rise contributed from the Greenland ice sheet within or by the end of this century is uh, quite plausible, I think. When the Arctic sea ice collapsed in 2007, I thought it was time to panic about climate change. And now after the Arctic 2019 setting all sorts of ugly records, I feel that deep uneasiness again. Can we still keep calm and carry on, so to speak? Well, I, I think actually it's, it, it's a, early, well, not, not perhaps so much an early warning sign because there have been lots of warning signs, but it's certainly bearing out the, um, some of the worst predictions in a sense from, from the um, climate models, or in fact some of the Arctic changes were not predicted by the climate models. It's a case where the observations are actually progressing more rapidly than the models were, were predicting, say, 20 years ago. So I, I share your uh, deep uneasiness. It is a, also a sense of great fascination to be able to watch what's, what's actually happening. But it would be nice perhaps to be able to do something a bit more about it. And perhaps some of this um, latest evidence from the Arctic will um, encourage us all to take stock of these changes and see what we can do about them. From the University of Lincoln, we've been talking with Professor Edward Hanna. Find links to the science we've discussed and more news about the Greenland melt in my show blog at ecoshock.org. Edward, thank you for sharing your time again with us. Thank you very much, Alex. I'm Alex Smith for Radio Ecoshock. If you have a story idea or thoughts on something you've heard, contact us, radio at ecoshock.org. That's radio at ecoshock.org.